very special episode of The Witching Hour. I am Perry Nemiroff, and I'm sitting with Haley Fouch, who color-coordinated with me today. Thank you. We're on a roll lately. I think we are. Your shirt is still cooler than mine, though. I like your shirt just fine. Thank you. I appreciate it. (laughs) So, part of the reason why I'm very excited for this episode, as always, because I get to hang out with Haley, but also because I'm mildly obsessed with Umbrella Academy, and I'm now even more obsessed with it after watching season two than I was after season one. (laughs) Yes. I was not obsessed with it after season one, and I am wholly converted. So what what was your initial reaction to season one? What did you like and what did you not like? It wasn't super for me. Um, I liked the characters, but I thought it dragged and was a little too hip on its own quirkiness in a way that didn't quite sell for me. So I didn't actually finish it the first time and then I tried to watch it again and I was like yeah this still isn't for me and then I had already like because of the job I I knew what happened having not yeah it. so when we got the season two screeners I just popped them on and was like yeah let's see let's see how I feel about it and like within 30 minutes I was like oh I guess I love this show now it's interesting to hear that perspective because when I was watching season one, it took me like, I would probably say three or four episodes to really get fully into it. Like I was just watching it because it was a very popular thing at the time. And I I just wanted to be in the know, but it took a little while for it to really click. And for me to feel an attachment to those characters, because, you know, like they got some shitty qualities at the beginning. And also that that style and tone and pace, it, it takes a little getting used to. But once it clicked, like I, I was, I was hooked. I was all in, and I was wondering if season two is that strong right from the start because I had that pre-established foundation. But I now I'm thinking that it goes well beyond that because even though you weren't into season one, like you still were able to connect within thirty minutes for season two. Yeah, I think that if I had to guess, it was intentionally designed that way that like you don't need to have not not only liked, but have seen season one to get on board with two. Um, the intro is so strong and it sets, oh, it's yeah. like, it's a bit of a soft reboot for the season. Um, you know, all the characters are separated. Everything's, by the way, that's revealed in like the first 30 seconds. That's not spoiler. <laughs> the, the, the spoiler sensitivity with this one is high. I'm I'm like a little scarred from running my non-spoiler review and like the extreme reaction that came from it. But like since since when is just like basic background information in a review too much? Yeah, I don't know about any of that. But that happens immediately. And so that for me was really strong. And I also think that that was... Um, important in terms of like what I really like better about this season, which is they definitely still have communication problems, but that is not the crux of why things go wrong for them. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, they actually are separated by real things that they don't control. Yeah. I I thought that that was probably, and I, I don't know if this is the exact format the graphic novel takes, but I thought that was one of the most genius storytelling decisions was to spread all the siblings out over a three-year period because you also get the opportunity to challenge them to grow as individuals, but also as a group as well, as they find their way back to each other. Um, I will give like a light heads up. If you are someone who doesn't want to know any plot information whatsoever, like maybe just peace out because (laughs) I don't know. I like, I, I'm not the kind of person who wants to hear a review where it's like, that character was cool. I liked what they did with that. I, like, I want a little bit of context. So we're going to have to reveal the very basic premise of each storyline if we're going to talk about it, even in a non-spoiler capacity. So, yeah. Non-spo- yeah, non-spoiler wise, I, I will say every single sibling in season two got a storyline that I think challenged the character as an individual to grow and was also very intriguing and engaging. Basically, I liked every single one. The two that really excelled for me, though, were Allison and Vanya. Mm -hmm. How did you you feel? 
definitely Allison, I think, is the star of season two. Uh, she really stood out in season one because Emmy is so talented. Mm -hmm. But uh, the storyline that gave her this time around is really strong and ties into that whole, like, I feel like this season really let them, it's not all about the family, right? There are other things happening that are important that they're dealing with, whether it's a, a world issue, a relationship issue, um, money, belief, things like this, they all play a part. And uh, she, I mean, they gave her a lot to chew on. So they she's did. phenomenal. I thought Vanya was excellent. So much more interesting than um, her subplot in season one was one that didn't really work for me as well. Um, it just felt like a B plot leading into the A plot. But a lot of that, I was like, yeah, we know how this is going to go. Yeah. Uh, but also, I would, no surprise, Klaus, excellent. Uh, Steve Wheeler, I love the direction they went. Yeah. He's Robert so Sheehan can just do no wrong. It's like, I, I didn't like the movie Mortal Engines, but I liked watching him in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's he's been a favorite since the very very beginning, and like Aiden Gallagher is just like I, I don't I don't even know how to explain how talented he is in general, but also how well his skill set just suits the role of five. It's just they do exactly what that character is intended to do, which is like appear to be a child, but with this incredibly like commanding presence where every single time I look at him, even though he hit some bumps in the road in the season, I always look at him and I'm like, like five's got the answers. Yeah. That kid is like prodigiously gifted. I don't, it, it, it's so hard to like, I don't know. That's a learned thing, right? Being old is something that settles in as you learn. So capturing that being a 16 year old, is tremendous and um, I don't know how he does it. Maybe he knows a lot of old people. I don't know. I don't know. I was spot on. I was really impressed with him round one. So the fact that he like upped it a couple notches in the second season, I was just pretty shocked. Yeah. Who is the casting director on this series? Cause oh yeah. So good. That is a, a name well worth shouting out. I mean, it's just one of those unsung roles in film and TV production that makes mm -hmm. all the difference. Man, there was a there was a very recent episode of Ladies Night where we got into a casting director conversation, and I would love to plug it right now, but I can't remember which one it was. So many interviews. I know, and so so good too. I mean, having having Emmy Raver Lampman on the show was like <laughs> such a dream, and she's wonderful. Amazing. Uh, sorry to everyone, the gardener is here and the dogs are mad about it. <laughs> uh, so the casting directors were Libby Goldstein and come on the internet, you can do it. It can't do it is the twist. It's still okay. this IMDb page. <laughs> and I got you covered. Lowry Johnson. Oh, you got it? <laughs> Ooh, and Junie Lowry Johnson was a casting director on Gross Point Blank, one of my all-time favorite films. They're, but really, they're, they're casting on the show season one and season two is just some next level stuff between the main ensemble and then also when you go beyond it, especially in season two, all of the new characters that they introduced this time around are so, so special. Because so, it's like, with Umbrella Academy, you, so, you fall so hard in love with the Hargreaves siblings. Yeah. Like it, it must be the most immense challenge to break through that and really make an impression. But there's a couple of newcomers this time around where I just like, I fell head over heels for them as individuals, but also with what they bring out of the sibling that they're interacting with most. Yeah. We'll talk more about her, but for me, it's uh, the winner is uh, da, da, da. Rita, Ritu Arya as well. Yeah. Phenomenal. She is, she's just one of those actors where the second she's in frame, you are immediately like drawn to her and captivated by her. It's just, it's a very, very natural presence that you can't get enough of. And on that note, I actually, I loved what they did with Diego this season. I know, me too. <laughs> um, who was very good in the first season, but I think played a little more straight 
and they have yes. more fun with him this time and it really works. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not a spoiler. We also have a shot of them together in the trailer, the way that David Castaneda and uh, Ritu Aria play off of each other is also a major highlight of the season. Fantastic. Another highlight is Tom Hopper getting to yeah. fully embrace the humor of Luther this time around. And not to say he doesn't have more dramatic beats because he had a couple that really kind of like tugged on the heartstrings there, but like, his... His work in the in the comedy zone here, I think, was one of the best of the bunch. I think it really stands out, too, because, um, as you mentioned, all the characters have some unlikable qualities. But I think he was a real struggle for me and from what I've seen online for a lot of people in season one. Uh, mm -hmm. Not because of Hopper's performance, but because the character was so self-serious uh, most of the time. And they all made terrible choices that lead to the apocalypse. But... Boy, he made choices. Yes. Um, so I definitely had less qualms this season and a big part of it across the board, but specifically with that character was a willingness to lay off the self-seriousness of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I don't want to go into spoiler territory without name dropping two other uh, new characters that they bring in here. Mm -hmm. Yusuf Gatewood who spends a good deal of his screen time with Emmy Raver Lampman. I thought he was phenomenal. I mean, he he really, I mean, him and Marin Ireland felt like main members of the ensemble. And I, I just can't believe how, you know, in season two of a show like this, where you're so focused on one particular ensemble, how well developed they were by the end and, and like what extreme arcs they experience. Very true. Um, I feel that, as a whole, the the writing felt a bit more holistic this season. Mm -hmm. In the sense that I didn't, maybe on rare occasion, but did not so much have that feeling of like, I know where this B plot is going and I would like to get to the point. Yeah. Everybody really worked for me, whether they were the new characters or the old mm -hmm. characters, it all felt like a much more cohesive whole as a, I don't know, just as a sense of storytelling. And it could be because from what I understand, having barely gotten into the graphic novel world, it's pretty different um, this season. And I, I would imagine that for the writers taking that, making that decision to embrace the world they're creating in their show a little bit mm -hmm. more than trying to stay super uh, faithful to the comics is, is a part of that feeling of just all coming together really cleanly. Yeah, just the script overall and the structure of it felt way more refined this time around. It, it really didn't feel like there were any loose ends. It Another, what? It moves. like Oh, this. yeah, absolutely. Oh, those music cues are so good again. Oh, my God. They're it's so like good. The jolts of energy you need and yeah. exactly when you need it. Oh, I love it. I uh, I do plan to rewatch it at some point and... Um, I will have Shazam on auto the whole time. Although, no, you know, the internet is the internet and there'll be a full Spotify playlist like as soon as it comes out on Netflix. Probably. I I definitely will be rewatching. This is, it's a very rewatchable series too. There's, I'll get to it in, in the spoilers, but there's one particular thing that I rewatched quite a few times after I finished the whole season. But one, one more shout out before we go to spoilers. Justin H. Min, who plays Ben, because, like, again, I, I liked what they did with Ben well enough the first time around, but here, the role actually, like, gives him the opportunity to show up some nuance in his performance and let him grow as an individual and not just be, you know, tied to the situation he's stuck in, and I don't know, I, I thought Min just really ran with that opportunity. That was very interesting to me like with the way I watched the show, because I after I watched the season two screeners, went back and revisited season one and watched it all the way through. Um, and I was a bit surprised, like how minimal his role is in season yeah. one. And um, it just, I like, remember him being bigger. What it is in season one too. Sorry? It just is what it is in season one also. Like it is the descriptor and nothing more. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. And, and I remembered probably because that, whole setup is so, I don't know, incredible and brilliant. Like that's a wonderful idea. Yes. Um, I, I remembered it being a much bigger part of the first season. 
and was surprised to be like, oh man, he's not around much. Well, I guess also because of like, like the big impression he makes at the very end. It's like sometimes the stuff that happens at the very end weighs more heavily in your mind. It, it really is incredible to me. This is a tangent, but when you go back and you rewatch something and like you've binged an entire season and you're like convinced that a certain something happened much later in the game than it really did. It always fucks up my head. It's um, This happens to me a lot when I rewatch Daredevil, which I love and rewatch often. I, I always think people are in more episodes and have more time than they actually did because the actors are so strong. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. It is a it's a sign of powerful performance. Yeah. Okay. Can we talk about spoilers? Yes, please. All right. This is it. This is your warning. This is my spoiler wave. If you have not watched all of Umbrella Academy, season one and season two, this is your cue to leave. Go check it out. I have a very, very good feeling you're going to enjoy it. And then you're going to enjoy this conversation after you watch it and you come back to this video. So goodbye to everyone who hasn't seen it. Before you leave, one quick thing. If you were like me and like a little mix on season one, liked what they were trying to do, but didn't like how they did it so much, definitely give this a shot. I can't really... Uh, uh, sum up how quickly enthusiasm for these episodes traveled through the Collider staff that had screeners. Yes. It, it was, it's one of the most impressive like word of mouth enthusiasm, enthusiasms I've seen among the staff in a while. I, I will echo that. It's, it's been very fun to track all that in the Slack. All right, spoiler time. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna go character by character so we don't miss anyone and we have a little organization here. Um, Haley, I will give it to you. Where do you want to start? Oh, um, gosh, I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> I can just go down the IMDb if you want to. Let's do that, because I am okay. here forever. So first up on the list then is Ellen Page as Vanya. And like I said earlier, one of my favorite storylines of the entire season. I really liked what they did with Vanya in season one, particularly you know, as it pertains to how she was treated as a kid and why that has basically, you know, sealed her fate in a sense and, and her behavior. But I also thought that one of the most brilliant plot decisions in season two was to have her have amnesia mm -hmm. and get to start with a clean slate and build herself. And then to see that collide with the Vanya we knew from season one and with the past that we knew existed with her and to see those two things blend together so well, I think not only made for a really good storyline for her in season two, but makes that one of the most exciting characters for me in season three now. Mm. Yeah, I really, so there's a lot I like about season two and how it mirrors season one in different ways. And the whole amnesia bit definitely, you know, like is a sort of mirror version of what she experienced as a child and not having access to her full self. Um, and what I find interesting about that is in both cases, it reveals her to be a very good person without the influence of powers and things like that. Um, and so this time around, I mean, obviously kind of the whole riff is that they're actually there for her instead of abandoning her every single turn, which I love so much as an answer to season one, because that that element of failed communication was one of the most frustrating things for me. I know that's what it's about, but it also kind of grates when you're doing 10 hours of it. Mm -hmm. So seeing them unite around Vanya instead of constantly, I mean, rewatching season one, it was incredible how often they go, this isn't about Vanya. Vanya is not a part of this. Uh, we don't have time for Vanya. And I know that's the point, right? Yeah, it, I know. It's, it's so that you go every time they do that, you go, well, you're bringing on the apocalypse by doing that. Um, but I don't like it. <laughs> and I liked this so much better. And she's so good. I was talking to Ali about this and they made a very good point, which is she's the biggest star of the show and she takes on the least flashy role. And I really appreciate that. That's not something every star would do is bring mm -hmm. their power to something that doesn't give them all the funniest lines and the best makeup and all that. Um, and I, I love that she kind of in both seasons really grounds it and does such wonderful work with that. 
She really does. That role this time around had, I mean, last season too, had such sensitivity to it. It just very often melted my heart. And, you know, more great chemistry in the show comes from Vanya's relationship with Sissy. Marin Island, who we don't talk about nearly enough. True. Like, why the fuck isn't she a bigger thing? (laughs) She's just one of those actors that seems to bleed into things so beautifully. You take her as a part of every show rather than taking her as the actress away from it, I feel. Oh, their their relationship and like where you knew it was. He- it was so that was like another thing that I found so stressful in a good way about this season, knowing that they were going to have to leave and they create such powerful relationships with some people from the 60s. It's like this entire time. You know, I'm so torn between rooting for them to take them with them, but also that ache of knowing that they can't. Yeah. That relationship worked a lot for me, and it highlights, I think, another strength of the season two, which is that going back to their obstacles aren't just each other. They are in a different time in which they cannot safely be themselves. Um, And they, they do that in a way that, to me, didn't feel preachy, but felt like it further enhanced the drama of the story. Mm -hmm. That's that's a big reason why I think season two far more than season one. I I briefly said this in my review, but it's worth repeating. It makes Umbrella Academy more than, you know, just a fun show to watch. It, It leaves you with a couple of themes, ideas, messages, inspiration that you can actually apply to life today between Vanya's storyline you have what Allison goes through you have Klaus's battle with addiction they're like they're tapping into some very real weighty things and you know they're they're doing it in a very natural way that ensures they seep in right and in the you know at sort of the root of all of it is dealing with a family that's been through horrific abuse Mm -hmm. and that is not light and fun but they make it go down in a way that you process and think about, but isn't like watching a drama that's going to ruin your day. Mm -hmm. Just to tiptoe into uh, ending explain territory, because I feel like I don't want to forget anything. So Mm -hmm. I need to stick to the character organization thing. So at the end of the season, we see Harlan in the car Mm -hmm. and he clearly still has some of Vanya's ability left in him. Do you think that this somehow paves the way to the group of individuals who are back in 2019? Oh, man, we have such different organizational brains. I don't even know how to talk about this without talking about the other characters first. Okay. Uh, I So before we move, I will just say that for me, the one thing I truly look like that's goofy this season was her giving Harlan her powers by breathing. I That doesn't track um, it doesn't make any sense. And I think everybody was way too chill about the fact that she brought back somebody from the dead. Like, none of that really played for me. Well, okay. So it it felt, it felt a little hokey, I think, just from a visual perspective to me, just because we've seen, we've seen, you know, uh, effects like that. And these weren't necessarily the best with the way I'm specifically talking about the way that it's transferred into him. Like, I feel like it reminded me of a million things that I saw before, but I don't know, like Vanya's powers are so, are so erratic. And I think they're the only power set, or maybe not the only, but one of the, one of the power sets that I think has like the least definition to it. It's like, when I think about, when I think about Allison, you know, she says, I heard a rumor and then I know what happens next. Luther is super strong, but like, Vanya, there's a lack of clarity there. So that's why I was able to digest that happening. And also the way that it was shot blocking wise with what other people had seen. Mm -hmm. That's what also let me get away with the fact that, you know, he probably flat out died and then she brought him back. That seems to be the implication. Um, I just think everybody was way too chill about that. That's massive. (laughs) Like the ability to bring someone back from the dead should be exploding heads, not just but like. If, so if anyone had a big reaction to bringing someone back from the dead, wouldn't it just be Vanya? Because Sissy kind of runs in at the end for all she knows that he never, he never really died. And she was just giving him mouth to mouth. I need to revisit and see how she explained it to her family. Um, but I feel like they all took it really chill. And maybe okay. that's 
me misunderstanding the wording she used. But in any case, I don't want to harp on the one thing I didn't like too much. No, I hear you. It just didn't really play for me. I will say regarding the power is something I really, really love about those opening 30 minutes that hooked me so much. Uh, like in that, that very opening sequence where we see them facing down this new apocalypse, um, we saw them flex their powers, all of them, to such an extent that we have not seen before. That mm -hmm. was immediately interesting. Like, oh, how did they get there? Yeah. We didn't fully get those answers in the season because obviously the timeline goes different ways. But um, I, I am extremely interested to see the full extent of everyone's powers should the season con or the series continue. And what I've read online, like Allison's powers are actually tremendous when they are fully unleashed you know really? her, like literally i heard a rumor i blew your mind and their heads explode oh yeah, like, yeah we knew she could do before uh apparently that's like barely scratching the surface huh. i'm excited to see all the different ways that she can use that then <laughs> or like luther taking a full-on missile to the back what <laughs> do you want do we want to move on to luther now he's next on the list yes how'd you feel about luther this season not much to do, but very fun to watch. Yes, I will agree with that. I appreciated how much he ate <laughs> the season two. <laughs> they were a bread pit on that acting thing. Yeah, the, the, there was really a lot of that. But, you know, in general, it, it felt like Tom Hopper embraced the comedic element of the character more so than ever. And that, that was like the main takeaway for me. But that is a very, very emotional scene he got with his father yeah and i quite enjoyed what he did with some of with some of those deeper beats like that so he's probably the character that i think did the least growing of the bunch but there was still something there for him and i just enjoy his presence overall that's the thing i just enjoy his presence <laughs> oh and the other the other thing it's not just the stuff with the father it's also i really like i really like what they did with the the love triangle between luther allison and ray it was just, you know, a lot of complicated feelings there. And, you know, even though it's an awkward situation for him, I like, I really felt for Luther. Yeah, I did too. I do. I guess I wish maybe he had like a little more growth, but it, it's a huge ensemble. It can't always be everyone's season. And that is true. Major focus in season one. So I, I, I'm completely cool with him taking a bit of a backseat when really like, I mean, given the time, frame that it's set in, he would not be the person who has the most struggle. So that yeah. makes sense. Very true. But yeah, Tom Hopper, wonderful. He's so charming. He's so charismatic. He's so large. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Ali, again, referred me to his online presence. So I checked out his Instagram. And what just a delightful human. Oh, well, uh, well I'm going to go follow him. And a health nut and so pure. OK, I'm going to go follow right after. <laughs> Next up here, we have Diego. Love. Yep. Love, 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 love. I'm, a, I'm a very, very big fan of that storyline. Just the whole idea of him being the cookie cutter hero and how that idea is essentially turned on its head in this situation where like you're time traveling and you, you can't be the solo hero on your own and save the day. You've got to make sure you listen to your siblings in his case. I thought that all of that played real well. And again, going back to his back and forths with Lila, oh. you know, it, it wasn't just like that perfect pacing that they had going on and that like, you know, like their back and forth had like that really infectious bite to it that I was getting a kick out of, but also what they bring out in each other given who they are because the big spoiler with Lila and the big spoiler that we also haven't talked about is the handler's back and Lila's her daughter. Yeah. Well, kind of shady. Kinda. Yeah. yeah. Shady, shady deals there. Um, I, so I guess I, the only thing that doesn't super play for me is them trying to make him the dumbest brother, which is clearly Luther. Uh, Diego makes a lot of smart calls. He's just super impulsive and emotional. Yeah. Um, I, other than that, again, love that they had more fun with him. I adore that they turned his savior complex into a problem. Like, uh, it was a problem in the first season because he was always getting arrested and shit. But, uh, 
putting him in a mental institution for his savior complex is genius. That's like so good. Um, and I think that actor, Dave Castaneda, is that right? David Castaneda. Castaneda has so much potential. Like, not that he's not excellent in this show, but seeing what he did with them giving him more to chew on this season and more fun to have, I feel like that kid is a freaking star. Yeah. I really, I think I feel that way about almost all of them now that I'm looking at the list here. He really stood out to me because they did kind of change up his character a bit more than the rest. He mm -hmm. is a lot goofier. He's a lot more emotional. Yeah. And um, a lot more lost. Also, I think the... Uh the hero complex thing wound up playing very well with his, you know, reunion in a sense with his mother. Like I thought, I thought those were going to be, you know, two things that were, you know, ultimately going to be too much heavy lifting for one character in one season, but, but they wove together especially well and kind of, you know, challenged everything we knew of him in season one and for him to kind of like step beyond that and rethink that in a way that I think actually paired well together. I I love what they did with that character. And and I we're going to subvert IMDb because it would feel weird to like not talk about Lila right now. Um, I was just going by IMDb for the Hargreaves siblings. <laughs> Go crazy. Uh, I just... Well, also, I think she's like way down on the list because nobody knows the character yet. But uh, I, again, have to compliment the casting department. What a find. Their chemistry is so fantastic. Her chemistry with Kate Walsh is so fantastic. Yes. Kate Walsh is a killer. She is so good. I yeah. love her in that role. Delicious, delightful. And, and she seems to be enjoying it so much too. Yeah. And like sometimes, like when that happens, you can just feel it and you feed off of it. Absolutely, I I love every sequence, every second that she is in, and and you know, people say chew the scenery like it's a bad thing, but that is not always a bad thing. And she does it beautifully in this show. She also has chemistry with everyone too, like. I, I really enjoyed The Handler and Lila. I really enjoyed, you know, what she was doing with Diego, too. And then also her conversations with Five are hands down some of the best of the bunch. And most of those are, you know, incredibly dialogue heavy with loads and loads of plot information. But there is something about it that makes you like laser focused and hanging on their every word. And I think that speaks to Aiden Gallagher and Kate Walsh's extreme talent here. I also just have to, maybe we'll take this as a transition to five because I feel like everything I want to say about Lila ties into the very ending. Go uh, for it. Again, another testament to Aiden Gallagher's ridiculous talent because Kate Walsh is not just a veteran actress. She is chewing up that scenery. She is loving the role, living it, having the time of her life. And he's matching her as a teenager. Like, Dude, come on. <laughs> what is that? I, I don't know. He matches everyone. Yeah. I, I'm just so impressed because she really, to me, does stand out as the veteran in the cast, or one of the veterans in the yeah. cast, let's say. And she does bring a certain amount of, I don't know what the word is, but it's not charisma because they're all charismatic. But it's like, whatever the big capital C version of charisma is. She brings that to the table and for him to match it just wows me. Are you gonna use the G word, gravitas? Yeah. What? <laughs> got some, she's got some serious heavy G going on. Yeah, yeah, She she's delightful. And also, I mean, that's an excuse to bring up the incredible costume design. I mean, clearly that's something that they go especially big with, with her character. And I think they do a phenomenal job, but you know, even more, casual clothing i think they pull off very well and this is like a, a heavy production design challenge and they freaking knock it out of the park so how do you think about regarding five how do you think they did in terms of he's basically serving the same function again this season how do you think they did it making it feel different i think i think it's i think it's more nuanced than that like, I, I think I can, when I'm watching him, and also, like, another another thing that I love that Aiden Gallagher does is, you know, 
five is a very verbose individual, but I also think there's an extra layer where I could see the wheels and his head turning. And whenever I watched him work through something, it, it always brought me back to his experience, not even just in the past season, but what he went through in the past, or at least his timeline in the past, every decision he made was attached to something else that he had learned about. So yeah. I feel like that was the growth more so than, you know, I don't know. Like I'm trying to think of like a, a really simple example. Like, like I learned I had the power to raise my arm. So I raised my arm the entire season and now I'm different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, so for me, it is definitely, it's like the same functionality, but it didn't bother me at all. It didn't feel like a repeat, even though it, it definitely is. Like he's hopping through time, trying to stop the apocalypse again. He, he is, but his actions are still kind of different. It's like, even when you see, you, you, like, you know, that, that one arrangement he makes with the handler where he's got to kill everybody on the board. Yeah. It, it's like in moments like that, like I think back to the previous apocalypse and now he's just like, he's dealing with the trauma of having experienced that and not having fixed it. Now he's in such a panic that he's willing to take such a big swing like that. Yeah. So like maybe, you know, and also like another thing that I think uh, sets him up really great for season three is, you know, in, mo in most of season two, he is trying to rally the siblings together, but I don't think he gives any of them the credit that they deserve. And I feel like they wind up in a place where he's got no choice but to start doing that. Yeah. So it would be nice to see him still function as a leader in season three, but also as a team player. I like that take a lot. And I think that would be a nice growth for the character because it is very much intrinsic in who we were introduced to that he looks down on his siblings. Understandably, having survived 45 years alone in the apocalypse, you will probably be weird. <laughs> um, and they are kids with a lot of emotions and they're very horny. And he's like, we got to stop the end of the world, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, but I would like to see that growth too. And I, I just... um when i all right i'm gonna save all it's all the ending stuff so let's let's who do we have left who we got oh okay so do you want to do uh klaus and ben first and save allison for last didn't we do allison no we didn't we just love her yeah. so we keep talking about her I know, yeah I, I like keep wanting to save her for last because she's my favorite <laughs> yeah let's do it um i already said like robert sheehan damn it oh, damn it you charming son of a bitch <laughs> He's so good. I can watch him do anything. It doesn't matter. And I, I really do. I, like, I got such a kick out of the idea of Klaus starting a cult and also how he operates as the leader of that cult. And I think that fed into his relationship with Ben as Ben kind of being like the angel on the shoulder. But when we got to the end and Ben figured out how to take over Klaus's body, that was that was like almost everything that I needed from that character. I just like I wanted I wanted him to have that moment so badly. And then that's a perfect example of something where I was like, like, I'm sure this is going to work out for like, he's going to get his moment here. He's going to get the girl. And then all of a sudden they like veer to the left. And I'm like, Oh fuck this shit. I felt so bad for him. I have another great moment of that it was when they had the briefcase, but they all had to work together to be at the yes. same place at the same time. And they couldn't pull it off. That was another, like, you think, you know how this is going to go. And then Nope. Yeah. Um, what I liked about, uh, in terms of the thing I said about mirroring the seasons, like I feel very much that Ben was in service of Klaus in season one, and that dynamic flipped this season. It was really more Ben's story. It may not come across that way because Robert Sheehan is so damn dynamic and scene stealing, but I do feel that for the most part, that their screen time was focused on giving Ben his time in the spotlight. Yes. and time to take a more active role in the story which i very much needed um what it, what do you think ben's fate is which ben <laughs> we, um as in you know in in the end he mm -hmm. he gets a good deal of closure there yes i think sure. that version of ben has crossed over and we will not see him again it, which yeah. is beautiful and lovely and it really touched me and it did make me cry and I'm not ashamed of it. I love that resolution. I love how they used his, uh, you know, call it a power or just being a ghost to be able to the one, be the one to get into Vanya. It, it was 
a super smart play on just what the powers of each individual person means, but mm -hmm. also so much very time for that character to have that moment. Even though I'm glad Justin H. Men still gets to be on the show. I guess I'm I'm being a little sensitive about it just because like my hope is that Umbrella Academy goes beyond season three and I'm imagining they are the foil of season three. So does that mean he's only got one season left? And I get like a little stressed about that. So like I, I, I'm not, even though I really appreciated the closure and I think it was done well, I feel like what I got from Ben made me want even more of him and I'm not ready to say goodbye to that rendition of the character. But maybe that's just like me being selfish and wanting more of what I liked. No, I get that. I, for me, I look, as this show has demonstrated many times over these two seasons, you cannot ever know for sure if a character is gone and dead. For me, if they undid that particular choice, it would feel cheap to me. You are right. Um, but I am hopeful that next season's journey will perhaps see them you know assuming we get next season which isn't confirmed but like it's super popular and likely um i my hope is that they will have learned from these two seasons that it is all about uniting and unifying and try to make the sparrow team part of their family in some way or even if it's just then that he won't be relegated strictly to an antagonist role, but that some part of that journey will be about trying to reconnect with him. Okay. I like I had a follow up. It just sounded like a bird tweeted over there. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. That was very intense. Um so you you think that ultimately in season three they're gonna have to join forces with with the Sparrow? What what, what are we calling them? The Sparrow team? Are they the Sparrow Academy? Is that what they say? Sparrow Academy, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would imagine so. So this goes into like my bigger theories about everything. Um, my suspicion, especially after what we see with Vanya, is that Reggie is effectively, or his alien situation, is somehow responsible for these powers because we at the we see him in season one release those little light thingies, and then we see her transfer those light thingies to Harlan. Um, so, point being, like I do think that they're all in service of the same agenda, even if he decided fuck those other kids. Um, and I hope that that will give them something to unify behind. Okay. I mean, I like that. I like that theory way more than the traditional idea of, you know, the original characters are good and these new characters are evil and they must take them down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like um, that, that's so. insanely dry. And, and, you know, there's no like reason to believe that Reggie would not have been abusive to these children as he was to the Umbrella Academy. Um, so I suspect they probably won't be in love with their father either, but maybe he learned his lesson. I doubt yeah. it. So what do you think that this new timeline is? Do you think that they are in 2019 and have kind of distorted the original reality based on what they did in the 60s? What, what do you think that time is? Okay. So we had so many debates about this in side chats. Okay. Um, some people are on the parallel timelines theory train, I am super not. I think this is a traditional one linear timeline that gets rewritten every time they do something. I think that all the evidence is there in season one to suggest mm -hmm. that, primarily when we literally see five rewind in uh, the day that wasn't leading up to the day that was, everything that happened only he remembers. So I think that this is the one timeline they have changed it, either them, or Lila, who also takes off with the case, or, you know, all of that combination, Harlan having powers, has reconfigured this one timeline into where they jump back into 2019 and nothing is familiar, all la Back to the Future 2 type show, stuff. I have um, nothing to add to that because that is where my mind is at. <laughs> yeah, I, I fully don't think there's anything that supports multiple timelines yet. I could do that, but everything in the so show suggests no. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the whole purpose of the commission, right? Keep it on that one timeline. 
Exactly. I mean, you know, I guess the commission gets pretty fucked up, but I mean, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe that's actually a thing with the commission having lost so many agents, maybe just like shit just goes crazy and they create a million timelines because they couldn't keep stuff under control. I have so many questions about how time travel exactly works in the show and why exactly they land in the reality they did. I do think a big part of it is going to be that they told Reggie too much and he was like, fuck those kids. I can choose better. <laughs> I can get better kids. Oh, I definitely um, think that's part of it. Yeah. Because so, he didn't like them. So... Just to play that through a little bit, if if that is his mentality and he picks better kids, would that mean that a younger version of themselves or, or not necessarily, well, I guess kind of younger because they, they lived extra years by going back, but are there younger versions of themselves in this new reality? So that's a very good question. I don't have the answer to, but I've been pondering myself. Do, does them having left their timeline, so to speak, mean that they were never born? Is that why they're not in the Umbrella Academy? Or is it just that he was like, fuck those kids? I think, uh, it, I think it would have to mean it's just like, fuck those kids, because if they went back, well, no. If they went back they to the- certain things that prevented their own birth. That, that sounds so incredibly dark. <laughs> Like if if he took it to that extent and like sabotaged their birth, like well, it doesn't mean him, him. It could be any. It could be Lila. It could, yeah. be, it could yeah. be that they themselves, by mm. messing up the timeline, caused that ripple effect. Okay. But I, so here's. I, I mean, I think it's fun the idea of two of them existing at the same time. But you do run into a real storytelling problem and, and a logistics problem. Yeah. Because what are you going to, I mean, are you just going to have your all of your actors play two versions of themselves from here on out? Are you just going to kill one version of those characters off completely? I know, I'm not saying that can't happen, but my theory is that just for logistics, it won't. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to bet on that as well. Do we want to talk about Allison now? <laughs> Let's talk about Allison. She's so good. She's really? so good. Emmy Ray from Lampman is so talented. And like, I just, I, I wasn't ready for that. You know, not that there weren't like meaningful things happening in season one, but given everything that we're going through right now, that storyline, like, just like rocked me to my core. And the part that I was talking about earlier, where I watched all of season two, the thing that I went back and not necessarily watched, but I listened to it over and over and over again was the note that she leaves behind for Ray. Mm. I asked her about that in the spoiler section of Ladies Night because like you hear a note like that and it feels like it was written today and that it's being spoken to you. So I like I had asked her, like, is that something that was rewritten or changed? Did you do ADR very recently? And she's like, she said no. And she had such a good explanation for it that I'm going to completely spoil now. But it's like, you know, she basically said something to the effect of, you know, the the faces and the organizations and the ways we fight racism have changed over the years, but we're still fighting the same problem. So even though we came up with this storyline a year and a half ago, it's still relevant today. And the same is true of that note. And after hearing that and then listening to that note even more, I, like that is hand, I, I will be shocked if the end of 2020 comes and that is not one of my favorite storylines in the season this year. Love it. Yeah, she's excellent. I, I definitely, that's one of the areas where I was like, I feel like they really pulled off not being preachy in an impressive way. Um, I think they did that by reflecting weakness in her character, you know, when she gets vindictive against the guy who was cruel to them, the, the cafe owner, that kind of thing. It stops it from being, I, I don't know. There's just... You don't want a TV show to lecture you in a one-dimensional way because it makes it feel less genuine. And it felt very genuine. Her performance, I can't, really just can't rave enough about. Mm -hmm. and her, that character, just her consistently losing her family is really so heartbreaking. 
Yeah. Their, their chemistry, again, you know, her and Yusuf Gatewood, and espe- especially having come off of everything she develops with Tom Hopper in season one. I mean, the second I see the two of them together, I like, I fell head over heels for them. And the way that they deal with their differences as far as, you know, how to operate in this movement and how best to operate, but also how her having powers changes the games, the game for them. I thought that was woven in so beautifully where it didn't feel like, don't forget about our superpower, but like really challenged like the present problem in the sixties. And I, I don't know, that's just some really great writing there. I, uh, I also will give credit to the fact that I thought they were going to once again go the poor communication direction. And I'm so glad that it didn't take too long for her to be like, you know what? I just need to tell them. Yeah. I need to tell them what's going on. Uh, yeah. I really appreciated that. It's like when uh, <laughs> it reminds me of when Insidious actually included the scene where the husband believes the wife and they move houses. I was like, yay, they did the thing. She communicated. I love that there's an Insidious reference here. <laughs> Well, that was such a relief for me because usually in ghost stories, the wife's like, we're haunted. And the husband's like, you're crazy. Yeah, really? (laughs) Um, One other thing that I wanted to bring up that she said in the spoiler section of that interview, because, you know, like this was her experience in season two. And we all know they move on to a different main story in season three. But I am like very, very interested in seeing how you know, the lessons she learned and the things she experienced over the course of a three year period in the 60s affects her going forward. And, you know, she, she basically said that, you know, she she doesn't know, but she hopes that they do that because I don't know, like going through a situation like that is going to change you in a whole lot of ways. And I really hope that they hold tight to that and let that influence how she behaves in season three and beyond. Absolutely. And I hope that they embrace that they have brought up the civil rights movement and they have created an alternate um, reality of the present, present Mm -hmm. 2019, and that that is beholden to a certain amount of thoughtfulness when it comes to reinventing the world, having dug into that element of the story. Yeah, thinking, thinking about season three, it's like, on the one hand, they've got all the potential in the world now, but also like that was some real heavy lifting in season two. And if you're like, you're not just going to come up with a good storyline for season three, but you also have to embrace what you just did in season two. That is, it's, it's going to be a challenge, but if season two is any indication, I've got high hopes to pull it off again. So what do you think? And I don't think there's going to be a clean answer to this, but if you would uh, the kids mucking things up by interacting with Reggie, Lila taking off with a time briefcase, Harlan having powers. Which one do you think causes the biggest rift in the timeline? That's a very good question. I actually, I don't think it's going to be any one in particular. I think it's going to evenly be all three and it's just going to like come to a major head. Yeah, I, uh, I really, really hope that they can find a way. I'm so sorry. Her name just jumped out of my brain. The wonderful actress um, with Vanya, because she says, you know, we're going to California. If you find a way back to us, you yes. better take it. Right. And I would, her would be so much older, but I want that actress to come back. Oh, I would do anything. That I mean, that was that was also one of the sad parts of knowing that they couldn't actually time travel with them is because I just like I wanted to see her stay on the show. I know. I have a theory, like a hunch, that probably when they do catch up with Harlan, she will have died, just because that makes that really easy. No, Uh, probably true. But I would love for that not to be the case. Yeah, me too. Me too. I feel, yeah. I feel like me wanting more of all the stuff I love so much, but I don't care. (laughs) I'm a little, like, nervous to see what they do with Harlan, because it is kind of a touchy thing to be like, um, what if a child who appears to be on the spectrum had superpowers, uh, that's, you know, that's tricky territory in terms of um, how you portray that in a way that's not gross. Yeah. 
So I hope that season three doesn't start up and he's like the big villain or something, you know? No. Well, it's also because, you know, going back to things that they've done in, in season one with the Hargreaves kids, you know, they're they're very heavily into the idea of you having positive influences on your life, putting you on a better path. So, you know, if season two is any indication, I would think that, you know, Vanya's influence, not just as a, you know, a person with power, but also as a good human being and Sissy being a good loving mother would put him in a more positive direction. Yes, I hope so. And I hope that Vanya's storyline is a uh, portending things to come in terms of like a more positive direction mm -hmm. because her, her character has not been expressed as being explicitly on the spectrum, but like the stuff where like she kept killing her nanny because of the loud tea kettle was very much um, expressing that she did not have full control over her powers in a way that was really dangerous, which is what they were kind of playing with. Mm -hmm. well. Um and they did pave a more hopeful path for her. So I'm hoping they will repeat that. I have a question regarding the handler and the, um, so what, these agents that they're yes. sending through time, you know they can build them new bodies. That was brought up in season one, but now we've seen her take five Lila and Harlan. And I'm wondering, are all of the agents supposed to be super powered people? Like, cause we've seen her go after three. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait, who, who are we talking about in particular? When you say super powered, we're talking about. Five. Yeah. Lila and Harlan. And then when you think back on Hazel and I've just forgotten Mary J. Blythe's character, it's very oh, obvious yeah. they have extreme abilities that might just come from what they can do for body. Oh, yeah. That's that's how I read it. It's like right. their their skill set is something that's learned, mm -hmm. like through I don't know training classes or something like that. Whereas five and all of the babies born on what is it October fourteenth, something like thirteenth, fourteenth, something like that. Um, all the babies born on that day at that time they have superpowers. Yeah. That was also my initial read, but now having watched her collect, try to collect two more in season two, I'm like, maybe my whole understanding of this organization is wrong um, because we don't know anything about it, really. Well, she's also not entirely in line with the organization either. Like she's she's like playing by their rules for the sake of getting power and control. But like, I feel like her 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 agenda isn't a good representation of what that entire, you know, company if you want to call it that actually was out to do made to do very true because she did fake the kill order on lila's parents so i think there's i think there's two agendas at play there trickery afoot yeah i can't wait to see more i know i yeah. wish they would be like surprise we already filmed season three well i mean that's that's the upsetting thing right now too because you know season two dropped i mean season one dropped last year like we didn't really have that long to go. And you know, it's it's especially unfortunate right now because I, I'm willing to bet they're gonna get the season three order. This is a very popular property. And especially when you consider the fact that season two is so freaking good. But even if they do get the official order and we all get to like be really excited by that announcement, when are they actually gonna go into production at this point? Well, here's the thing, you know, like the world is not all in the situation that we are. You can film in other countries. That's true. It's It's doable. Okay, thanks for giving me a little bit of hope. <laughs> I, just, I, I just want things now because yeah. I, did I tell you I just binged all of Snowpiercer? Oh, no, you didn't. And it's like I, I got very sad when it ended because I liked it. And that's how I feel after I binge, especially the sadness hits even harder. And I was so happy when I started, you know, doing my research for an interview and I came across that they've already filmed season two. I'm like, thank God. Yes. I uh, <laughs> I actually, it took me a really long time to finally watch the season two finale because I was like, this is it for a while. So I, I like, I binged everything in the Umbrella Academy except the final episode and it took me like a week to watch it. I mean, at least it's a it's a very highly rewatchable show. Like I feel oh like it won't hurt as much because I, I will love re-experiencing these episodes. Yeah, and I can't recommend going back 
and watching season one enough, having seen season two. I do. I have been meaning to do that. <laughs> so there are a lot of fun callbacks in season two. Like one specific one that I can think of off the top of my head is that the finale episode is called the end of something, which is what, um, ah, I've lost my brain. The Kate Walsh's character says to five, uh, when they first meet in the apocalypse, he's like the end of everything. And she says, not the end of everything, the end of something. Okay. So that was a fun callback that I would I'm not have it. It, having not rewatched. I'm gonna go do a rewatch yeah. to everyone out there who has been watching. You've heard some of our theories, drop some of yours in the comments below. I I'm like, so curious to see where everyone's heads at, what your predictions are. So please share them with us. Cause we want to know. I know. Oh. I, I feel like we should have blocked out two hours for this episode because I have so much more. Exactly. Oh my God. There, yeah, there's a lot. But, you know, for anyone who's looking for more Umbrella Academy content, oh my, will Collider.com be loaded with it? Oh yeah. You know, there, I mean, like features, explainers, interviews, you name it. Like we have you so covered on this topic, you have no idea. I want to not forget to say something. Yes. Which is crops as hell to the action team this season. Yes. Oh my God, the fight scenes are so good. They really are. Some daredevil level fight scenes. I I will definitely echo that. Um, anything else you want to squeeze in before we- I'm like, what did I forget? What did I forget? That was- I'm really like frantically scrubbing through the, uh, the cast list right now to make sure I mentioned everyone. Uh, there's just so much. I, I, I did want to make sure to single out the action though, because it was good in season one, but they yeah. super raised the bar. It was, it was great. That, that, I mean, that's always been an exceptional thing. And, you know, just like speaking, speaking of visuals too, I also just love again, how they, they capture just visually everything with Klaus and Ben. It's like every single time they were in a frame together, I'm like, this is beautiful. <laughs> All right. You want to close this out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was I? <laughs> I had something. And I lost it. So you'll have to wait till next week. Okay. I don't remember it. Put it, put it in your back pocket and randomly bring it up next week's episode. Well, so I guess we can tease this because it's locked and it's happening. Oh, next yeah. week's episode is going to be with Amy Simons for yeah. the movie She Dies Tomorrow. So hopefully Amy's also watched Umbrella Academy and you can bring this up to her. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if not, we can just watch her be really confused for a hot second and then we'll talk about her movie. Exactly. Uh, before we get to you, need to address something. <laughs> Hold on one second. <laughs> All right, guys. We are out of here. Haley, we're going to remember. I remember. I'm so sorry. Did what we address Reggie in his face? Oh. <laughs> it's, it's also really throwing me off how casually you call him Reggie. Oh, I think that's just what I do when I type to save time and now it's. Uh, my okay. <laughs> I was like, is that something that I missed? Out? His face. Yes. Please go for it. Um, what the fuck? I mean, he's an alien, but they really aren't giving us answers, man. No. I like I I like I don't even know I don't even know what to say about that. Right. And I know that I think there's more answers available in the graphic novels, which again I've just started getting into. Okay. Um, but I find it really interesting that each season, all two of them, has given us basically one scene that hints at his alienness. And yeah. That's it. Yeah. Um, I, I think they paved the way to that reveal quite well. And it's, you know, that's like another like major thing to add to the show, or at least in a more, you know, like concrete in your way fashion, in your, in your face fashion. But it's a it's a show of, of weird shit. <laughs> like, <It is. laughs> uh, I don't know. I guess I'm just like really was hoping that you would have theories on that because it it's such a big moment that almost disappears because there's so much going on. I feel like if you're gonna get any theories, it'll probably be from the graphic novels. Maybe not like if that is an element in them, I've never read them, but you know, even if it's just like a fraction of how the idea existed there. Right. And I mean, so, okay, we saw in season one, I believe, that he landed and went to the Umbrella Shop, hence Umbrella Academy. So where did Sparrow come from? What's that about? Hmm? Yeah. Hmm? He went to 
I went to a pet store instead. <laughs> they, they had the pet store scene in season two. Oh, yeah. All right. Anyway, I'm, <laughs> I have questions about the original Hargreaves, and I did not want to not mention them. Reggie. Reggie. My boy, Reggie. <laughs> All right, Allie, where can everyone find you on the internet? You can find me on Twitter at Haley Fouch and on Instagram at Haystack McGroovy. And I am at P. Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram. As always, a big thank you for hanging out with us and talking Umbrella Academy this week. That's it. We're done. You have officially survived the witching hour.